Hi guys, it's ASBYT and welcome to the ultimate smartphone buying guide 2020. Now I've been lucky enough to test and own hundreds of different smartphones over the last few years. So the question I've been getting asked tons at the moment is which is the best smartphone 2020 or which are the top budget smartphones 2020? So in this video, I'm gonna be breaking down all the key things you need to know and decide upon when looking at buying a new phone. And throughout, I will be making recommendations about which phones you might wanna get for specific reasons. I've also predominantly use one Android phone and one iPhone within that time frame as my so-called daily drivers. So my foot is kind of in both camps, meaning this will hopefully be as unbiased as possible. And due to the sheer in-depth nature of this content, I'm going to be probably breaking it into two separate videos. So smash the like button if you want to see the second part. And thanks to Anchor for sponsoring today's video. So the first key decision you will need to make when buying a brand new smartphone is a fairly obvious one. Are you going to go with Apple and one of their iPhones running iOS, Apple's iPhone operating system? Or are you going to go with a phone running Google's Android software with the actual handset being from a whole host of different manufacturers? Now, the decision may seem a simple one to you, but this debate of whether iPhones are better or whether Android phones are better has wrangled on for many, many years and it gets pretty heated at times. You've only just got to look in the comment section of this video when I say, tell me which you think is better and why. Just look at you all go. As far as I'm concerned, there really is no right or wrong answer. It's just what's right for you personally. So before we compare camera, battery, performance, etc., let's look at why you may want to purchase one over the other and vice versa. Firstly, why choose an iPhone? Well, probably the biggest reason is familiarity. If you currently use an iPhone, chances are you probably always have, and 80-90% of you probably always will. It was the first smartphone you liked, you got used to the App Store, the iOS software, upgrading each time to a new iPhone is easy, Do you know that files, photos, settings, apps, etc. are all going to transfer seamlessly onto your new iPhone from your old one, taking all the stress away from your current busy lifestyles. Sound familiar? But there's of course more to it than that. And another big advantage of iPhones comes into effect if you own other Apple products. If you've got a MacBook, if you've got an iPad, if you've got AirPods, etc. Because if you do, using an iPhone is going to give you an experience like no other when you're involved in that ecosystem. If you use AirDrop or like the ability to be able to respond to texts, etc. from your MacBook or iPad, then the iPhone is brilliant for this. I frequently send photos and videos from my iPhone 11 Pro to my MacBook Pro and that instant transfer that AirDrop offers is second to none. I've not experienced anything like it. Going back to using a USB cable and transferring files from an Android phone to my MacBook or Windows computer, it just seems so laborious. On the flip side, if you own a Windows laptop or PC or have an Android tablet, for example, instead of an iPad, then these sorts of features won't really be a selling point for you. If raw performance and benchmarks are your thing, then again, the latest Apple chip obliterates the Android counterparts. Whether that be Qualcomm with their Snapdragon 865 chip or Samsung with their in-house Exynos 990, Huawei with their Kirin 990, or even the latest MediaTek chips as well, the Apple A13 Bionic is insane. It continues to lead the game in this department. Now, before we jump onto some negatives about buying a new iPhone, here's a quick word from today's video sponsor, Anchor, who have sent me three of their brand new wireless chargers that are now live on the O2 website with 30% off all products until June the 4th. We have the PowerWave base pad, great for instant pairing due to its phone shaped design. The PowerWave Plus stand with two charging coils, so portrait or landscape charging is available. And the PowerWave 10 Dual Pad, which, as it says in the title, means you can charge two devices at once. And I've actually got this in two different colors. You can purchase the white one right now, but I'll actually be giving the black one away over on my Instagram. All have a premium design with superior safety, and I think with the three design options available, it gives great flexibility to choose a charger which fits your lifestyle. All chargers are using Qi technology, and all three have fast charging capabilities for certain phones so check the link below for more information on which option would be right for you. And remember, all three have money off deals until June the 4th. So jumping back, one of the negatives about buying a new iPhone is that everybody, unless you jailbreak it, is completely forced to use the phone in exactly the same way, and as Apple intended. It's a case of they know best and you should use the phone how they want you to. There is no individuality here. It's very restricted from layout to apps, and there's no room for customization, something that, of course, Android is famed for. At the heart of Android, you are free to open the shackles and create an experience that is individual to you. You also have far more choice of handset design due to devices being made from hundreds of different brands who can also tweak the Android software as well, means although the fundamentals are the same across all devices, no two phones are the same. So if you are looking to buy a new iPhone, what do you need to consider? Well, firstly, there's price, of course. What's your budget? 
Apple currently have five iPhones on their website that all vary in cost. We have the iPhone 11 Pro and the 11 Pro Max, which are the flagship best phones that Apple currently offer and are basically identical other than the fact the Max is larger and has a larger battery. Then we have the iPhone 11, which is a good option if you want the latest iPhone with the majority of features of the Pro, but you lose things like a camera lens and it doesn't have as good a display. And as a result, it's 300 odd pound cheaper. If performance is your key decision factor, then don't worry, all three have the A13 Bionic chip, as does the cheapest in the range, the brand new iPhone SE. It's a refresh of the old 2016 SE model, providing great performance, a decent camera, average to poor battery life, and a, let's face it, dated design. But it's 400 odd pounds as opposed to eight, nine thousand and plus. The final phone on the Apple website is the iPhone XR, which is basically the iPhone 11, but a year older in terms of chipset and camera, etc., and £100 cheaper than said 11. Now, because of this added choice in the Android market, it can be all that more confusing about which device to actually buy. So let's look at the differences between certain brands before looping back to compare and rank certain smartphones in the Android market and up against certain iPhones. So very base level, Google produces the Android software known by the cool kids as stock Android. They also produce their own Pixel phones famed for a great camera, average battery life, and let's face it, a rather dated dull design. Up to now, really excited for the Pixel 4a and the Pixel 5. But hundreds of manufacturers like Samsung, Huawei, OnePlus, Xiaomi, Oppo, etc., can create hardware devices and use Google software to run it, often adding a modified skin over the top, some heavier than others. OnePlus have Oxygen OS, Samsung have One UI, and Xiaomi have Mi UI, to name a few. Each are slightly different, each have advantages and disadvantages, so again, there's no real right or wrong answer, only preference. Currently, my favorite is probably Oxygen OS, and there are many others that I do enjoy as well. Now, the latest software running on the latest Huawei devices is a more complicated one. They've used the Android platform in the past, just like the rest, with their EMUI skin over the top, still using, of course, Google services, the Google Play Store, etc. But as of mid-2019, under instructions from the US government, their working relationship with Google altered, and as a result, they are now unable to use Google services. It was allegedly due to security fears, although other people say that this is unfounded and it was due to other reasons. I'm saying nothing. Quite what the truth is, we may never know, but what this means at a base consumer level is that the core experience is the same, but unless you sideload Google services, straight from the box you will have to use web browser shortcuts, etc. if you want to use things like Gmail, Google Maps, YouTube, etc. You obtain your apps on said devices from the Huawei app gallery. It's growing all the time, has great potential, but again, there is no native Google apps, which so many people in the Android market need. I personally have been using the Huawei P40 Pro a fair amount, and I have been able to pretty much use the phone as I would another Android phone, but some people won't want to use a web browser and will want to use an app for YouTube, etc. So basically don't write it off because it's a great phone, but just know that that needs to be considered. One quick thing, if you're scared of jumping between Samsung and Huawei and OnePlus and Xiaomi, etc., because you're worried about not being able to transfer all of your files, etc., then don't be. Much like switching from one iPhone to the next, you can easily transfer files and documents as long as you back up your old phone to the Gmail account you registered that phone to and restore on the next. And if you want to make sure all of your photos of pets and loved ones, etc., transfer across as well, you can use the Google Photos app on whichever Android phone you like and can continue to back up all of your snaps from any phone to one specific Gmail account again. This gives you great freedom to jump between different phones and just load up the Google Photos app and every time you use it, back it up, move on, and all those photos will still be there on your new device. Now, price is a key factor why a lot of people in the past have chosen Android over iPhones, as you can often get some brilliant Android phones with similar features, if not more features, but for a cheaper price. There is more competition on the Android scene, which has always kept prices down. Of course, in the last couple of years, some Android phone prices have crept up to match and in some cases actually become more expensive than certain iPhones. And that is largely down to the increase in price of the internal parts, most notably the chipsets. The monopoly that is growing for Qualcomm and specifically their top-end Snapdragon 800 series has meant the likes of the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra, for example, which uses in certain regions the Snapdragon 865 chip, has a price that is eye-wateringly high. While some people might not agree that the price jump was justified, there's no denying the performance of the latest chip is industry-leading on the Android side. Tests have shown that the 865 outperforms the Samsung in-house Exynos 990 chip, Huawei's Kirin 990 chip, and the MediaTek Dimensity 1000 in a lot of areas, although all of them realistically are excellent. 
Examples of real top tier performing phones that use these chipsets are the 8 Pro, the P40 Pro, the Find X2 Pro, and the Mi 10 Pro. Now these examples are from huge global companies, OnePlus, Huawei, Oppo, and Xiaomi. Massive companies, sure, but some of you might be thinking, sorry, who? They can't be as good as Apple or Samsung, surely, because I've never heard of them, right? Well, actually, not really. But on the whole, there is a good reason why some of you might not have heard of some of these companies, and that is simply down to marketing budgets. Some of these manufacturers actually outsell Samsung and Apple in certain countries, especially in China and India, which are two of the largest markets in the world. So we're talking huge numbers here. The quality of such devices is often as good, but funds for pushing these products to Europe and the Americas just hasn't been there in the past, something that Samsung and Apple have had. But times are changing and marketing budgets are increasing for these brands, word is spreading, and this is only good news because regardless of brand loyalty, more competition means better products. It forces innovation. So we've talked about a few high-end flagship phones, but what if you're sat there thinking, well, maybe I don't want the latest chipset. Maybe I don't want the best possible performing product. I want a bit more of a wallet-friendly device. A decent phone that does pretty much everything I need it to, but at a lesser cost. Well, you can get a phone like that in four main ways. The first way is simply to avoid the best possible phone in the flagship range. As most Android manufacturers not only have their top tier devices, but they also provide a mid tier or a budget option as well, all within that flagship series. A lot of companies, for example, will go with a pro slogan for the top end device, and then they just have the standard name or a light named phone. These phones often deliver similar experiences, but just with a few exclusions like no IP rating or no wireless charging for a cheaper price. Buying the OnePlus 8 over the OnePlus 8 Pro is a perfect example of this, as is buying the Huawei P40 over the P40 Pro, Samsung S20 over the S20 Ultra, you get the idea. The second main way you can avoid a packet on a new phone is to simply avoid the flagship series altogether. With similar design and build features as the flagships, but lower specifications of chipsets and camera hardware, etc. The Samsung A series is a perfect example, most notably the A71. Great S20 design, but because they use the Snapdragon 730, an upper mid range chip from Qualcomm, they can bring the price right down, so that's potentially a great option for you. The third main way of saving money on a brand new smartphone is to look out for a popular manufacturer's sub brand. A sub brand takes previously tried and tested technologies and ways of working and creates its very own brand identity altogether, but still fits under the parent company umbrella. Growing in popular over the last few years, these phones often have nearly all of the flagship features, but under the sub brand, they're usually released at a cheaper price, hence the term flagship killer. Such examples of these sub brands are Realme from Oppo, Redmi or Poco from Xiaomi, and really popular current products from these sub brands include the Redmi K30 Pro or Poco F2 Pro or the Realme X2 Pro, etc. And after all of this, if you really have to have a flagship phone, but simply don't want to pay for the flagship price, a lot of the time a phone that's a year or two and sometimes even three years old, if it was right at the top of its game back then, chances are it'll still do nigh on most of the things that you need it to do right now. We know that smartphone innovation has been incremental in the last few years, so if you can do without all of the latest gimmicks and bells and whistles, then that's certainly an option for you. In my head, I'm thinking about the likes of the Samsung S9 even, the LG G7, we're talking two odd years ago, and you can pick those sorts of phones up from Amazon or eBay for about 300 pounds. I hope you found this content helpful so far. That's the end of part one. We've got display, camera, battery, all to be looked at in part two. So drop a like on the video to let me know that you wanna see that and subscribe and turn on your notifications so you don't miss that video when it drops tomorrow or the day after. I'll love you and leave you. I'll see you in that next one. Say SPORT, peace out.